You know, I know there's a lot of, of controversy about the vaccines, but for a couple here on the second row, they are so glad to be back in church. Gil and Gail Box, it, it's good to stand up, Gil and stand up, Gail and Gail. They, 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 good to see them. Our sweet Gail teaches and writes, and, and they've just been such a blessing. They came and said, "This is our first service back in over a year," and so we're we're so glad that they're able to come back. There was a lady who was traveling in, in a town, and on a day much like today, she got to her appointment early, so she started, decided to stop, get a cup of coffee at an outdoor cafe. And as she's sitting there at a cafe, she saw the most unusual funeral procession go by. And there was one hearse, and it was followed immediately by another hearse, and it was followed immediately by a, a woman dressed all in black, which she was followed by a big black dog the chain around him. And then there were 50 women lined up in single file behind him. And this lady was drinking her coffee. She, she'd never seen anything like this in her life. And she's like, she forgot about any kind of decorum and just walked right up to the lady dressed all in black. And she said, I, I, I'm sorry for your loss, but what is this? The lady said, well, she said, up in the first purse is my, was my husband that he was attacked by this dog. They said, who's in the second hearse? She said, well, that's my mother-in-law. She tried to come to the aid of my husband and the dog attacked her. The woman said, well, wow. She thought for a moment, she said, can I borrow that dog? <laughs> and the lady said, sure, get in line. So we've been doing a series called a Moving Past Pain. And we're going to conclude that series this morning. It, it series has really struck a nerve, no pun intended, but it struck a nerve because I think everyone has dealt with pain in their life. And this morning I want to talk with pain that all of us have felt, and that is the pain of loss. Moving past the pain of loss. All of us have felt it but it doesn't mean it has to be the dominant thing in our life. There are different types of loss, and they really can range. There's the loss of resources. That's when you lose a job, or maybe you lose investments, or you lose your savings. We live in a, an area where oil and gas is big, and so that's been an up and down thing. So people lose jobs, they gain jobs back. And so the loss of resources is very real, it can be very, it can be very devastating. And, and then there's the loss of relationships. And that can range anywhere. And that can start young. It can range anywhere for losing a friend or maybe moving away from a best friend, uh, a loss of romantic relationships. Every time I think about this, I, I think when I was 14, I, we lived in, right outside of Greensboro, North Carolina. I went, to, I went to high school. And a high school that was a little bit more rural. In fact, many of the kids there were uh, their parents raised tobacco. This was back in the mid-70s. And uh, that was quite a, a cash crop. But it was kind of a rural, kind of a country school. And they still had dances, like school dances, a ninth grade, eighth grade dance, in the, in the school gym. Anybody remember those? Like, have, have those in the gym. So I, I went, and I liked a girl there by the name of Sonia Winfrey. And we fast danced a couple of times. But then the slow dance, slow dance was all the, that was the romantic time. I, it, it's not like ballroom stuff. It really was kind of embarrassing. And people, couples would just kind of stand there like this and move around and so. <laughs> but that was like a slow dance. So the slow dance, the last dance of the night, slow dance song, that's when all the romance took place. And I walked up to Sonia Winfrey and Sonia Winfrey saw me coming, turned and went and found Alan Willard and slow danced with him. And I remember slinking back into the shadows and uh, my mother picked us up. You're 14 years old, you're not driving yourself. So my mom picked us up and me and my two buddies, they all lived in the neighborhood. All of us struck out. And so we were, we were, <laughs> we were, we were going home. It's kind of quiet on the way home. I'm 14, but I'm like, I I'm hurting. And I go home and I, 
I had a FM radio. That was the big deal at the time. FM radio, and I cut it on. Man, with, with about two minutes, the Bee Gees came on. And they were singing one of their old hits. How do you mend a broken heart? How can a loser ever win? Please help me mend my broken heart and let me love again. Nah, 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 nah. I remember listening to that going, that's me, man. That is so me. I am just broken hearted. I'll never forget that song. And at 14, you're, you're thinking, oh, no, that's nothing. No, it is something. And you feel the loss. And there's a loss at 14, but then later there's a loss of a marriage or even the death of a loved one. And loss is very much real. And there's a word I call loss of respect. Resources, relationship, respect. That's when you've gone through something, it's kind of humiliating, and, and you lose a sense of dignity. That's a reality. The Asian cultures call it losing face. And when Joy and I came back from North Carolina, we had gone to start a church. We left Lakewood. We went to start a church in my hometown. It did not make it. We came back. And I remember when we came back, it was a face we had lost a sense of face. People treated us differently. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's the way it was. And you, and you sense that loss. And then, of course, there's the, it doesn't start with R, but it's very much real, the loss of health. And that can start with youth, losing your youth, losing hair, losing strength and the ability to be able to function. And so all of these are real. And the idea about loss is it has an effect on us. And the effects can range, but the effect is often sorrow. The thing about sorrow is if, if sorrow can actually, what the scriptures say, break your heart or, or cause you to be broken spirited. Look what it says here in Proverbs. Merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. The difficulty with that is it makes it harder to recover. Carissa Smith was a, a, a new mother. She had a four-month-old baby. They were, she was browsing in a library, and the baby's making baby noises, happy baby noises. And a gruff older man spoke up and said, if you don't tell that kid to shut up, I will. Never say that to a first-time mom. And Carissa, well, she rose up and she... <laughs> She looked this guy right now. She said, I don't know what it is that makes you unhappy to hear the sound of a happy baby. She said, but I'm not going to tell my baby to shut up. And she said, and I'm not going to let you do it either. And she kind of stepped back, waited for the onslaught to come. And he just was quiet for a moment. Finally, he dropped his head. He said, I'm sorry. And then he, as he looked at the Carissa smiling, happy baby, he said, I... Uh, I lost my son at two months. He died of SIDS. And Chris sat down beside him and he told her a story that happened over 50 years ago. And that sorrow that got in his heart that led to anger, that led to a failed marriage, that led to, to isolation. And the whole time he's telling this story, he's looking at this happy baby who's cooing and smiling at him. Finally he asked Chris, he, he said, can I hold her? And she she let him hold her little girl. And he just told her, put his cheek on her head. Tears came down his face. He handed her back and told her a genuine thank you. Everyone has suffered some kind of loss. But the idea is if, if loss stays too long, if sorrow stays too long, it can cause you to be heartbroken. And that makes it harder to recover. That's your story this morning. I want you to stay with me because the idea is you do not have to stay in a perpetual state of sorrow that God can help you. One of the best stories of, of loss and recovery is a story found in the Bible in the Old Testament with David. And David had led his group of 600 men. They'd gone out to go to war. They had come back and they were living in a city called Ziklag. 
And so a group of Amalekites had come in and they had burned Ziklag, stolen everything of value, kidnapped all the women and children, and didn't kill anybody, but they took off with them. And so this was a horrible story. We'll see how David responded. Happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city and there it was, burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Anoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now, David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod. That was a garment that they wore in, in the priestly role. So David inquired to the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, God answered him, Pursue, for you shall overtake them and without fail recover all. Could you imagine that David experienced a series of devastating losses at one time? Here he is, he comes back. They, probably, they could probably see the smoke rising up from, from Ziklag being burned. They could probably still see the smoldering embers from a distance. And their heart probably leaped in their throat when they got to Ziklag and the whole city had been burned, burned to the ground. So it was a loss of possessions. Your house is no longer there. The money box, they didn't have banks. The money box that you had, that's stolen. All your goods were stolen. Any clothes of value were stolen. And everything else was burned to a crisp. Lost. Those of you who experienced a flood or experienced a fire can talk about a, a, a loss and how devastating. You know, some of us just lost stuff during this, um, uh, during this freeze. But to see something that devastating is difficult. Then there's a loss of relationship, his loved ones. He looked, at, he looked around and his wives and his children had been kidnapped. Now, I, I think, I don't know what's worse. Maybe, maybe if they had been killed, that would have been worse. But, but the uncertainty that would play on your mind, wondering what are these people doing to my wives and my daughters and my sons would have been just almost hard to bear. And then not only that, but the relationships he had with his men. This was a band of brothers. These guys had fought together. They'd, li they'd lived together. They had accomplished great things together. And now the very people he's depending on have turned on you. If you've ever been betrayed, you know exactly how that feels. And they've turned on him. And now they're trying to kill him. I like, what the, I like what the scripture said about how David handled this. And I take encouragement from the fact that David, who was one of the mighty warriors and one of the great leaders of the Bible, didn't stand there with his hand on his hips and go, well, bless God, we'll get it all back. David felt this. And David, the Bible said, he wept until he didn't have any more power to weep. It ran out of tears. If you've ever been there, you know, it's like, I'm cried out. There's nothing more I can do. Not only did he weep like that, but he also had to deal with it, with the fact that he's distressed. He said, greatly distressed. Distressed means fearful, anxious, because his own men are trying to kill him. And David was in a low spot. And the fact that he went there, the fact that he, he felt that sorrow, to me is encouraging because it lets him know that David, even though we, we talk about his great exploits, was just as human as we are. David went there, but he did not stay there. He did not stay in a place of sorrow and distress. What David did next to me is amazing. But he went to the one whom he did not lose, and that was God. He believed that God was not the source of his losses. So how do you, how do you know that, Alan? Because you can't get encouragement and strength from the one that you blame. So he didn't blame God for the losses. And he was confident that God would help him. And David had established already in his life a pattern, a pattern of prayer and a pattern of praise. And you see it in the Psalms. David was the one. I, we don't know what David did, 
my guess is he went alone and he began to get to himself and, and he began to say, Lord, you, you've always been my shepherd. You have been my shepherd. Even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not have to fear evil. Lord, you are with me. David was the one that wrote, Lord, you are my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Lord, you are the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David was the one who wrote, I will love you, O God, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. David began to worship and David began to praise. He said, how do you know that, Alan? Because you don't get to a strong point without getting your focus off the problem and on God. And he got to a place where he's worshiping and, and, and got to a place where he was strong in God. And once he got to that place, then he starts to play, pray aggressive prayers. He's like, Lord, do you want me to go after them? There's a whole bunch of them. There were 600 of his men. He's like, you want me to go after them? And the Lord said, pursue or you'll catch them and you'll without fail over, overcome and, say, and you'll overtake them and you'll recover all. And you know, that's exactly what he did. He and his group took off and they found that group. They took them and not only did they get their stuff back, but they also got the other stuff that those Amalekites had stolen. And he actually turned out better in the long run than he did before he started. Aren't you glad we got a God who can absolutely turn things around and get things going in the right direction? So David... I read that story and I'm thinking, man, that's great. That's awesome. I don't, but you ever read the story in the Bible and go, ooh, I don't know if I could have done that. Listen, these things aren't written in the Bible to embarrass us. They are written to help us and to give us something to shoot for. And to say, you know what, it's possible. But I don't have to allow that pain to dominate my life that I can move past it. This morning, that's what I, let me give you some ideas of how you can begin to move past the pain. Listen, I know many of you have suffered pain. I know, I hear about all the losses that come in and the loss of jobs and relationships. And we hear about loved ones who have gone on. We know that's, that's a big part of a church family. We understand that. And we see that. And man, if, if, if I could, if I could take all those away from you, I'd love to, but I can't. That's part of life. But I can tell you that with God, you can overcome it. That with God... Sorrow doesn't have to be a permanent part of your life. Listen, all of us have visited sorrow, but we don't have to live there. It's not God's best that you would be overcome with sorrow. It's not his best that sorrow would be one of the biggest things in your life. Now, let me just stop just for a moment. And, and Matthew, my, my son, asked me, he said, Dad, your parenting tips. He said, always pay attention to your parenting tips. So let me give you a parenting tips. Many of my parenting tips on things I did wrong that if I had a chance, I wouldn't do again. Oftentimes when children come to us, our, our kids, boy, you talk about get your heart, they can get your heart. And when they hurt, we hurt. And one of the problems with, when kids come and express, they would come and express sorrow to me, I, I, a fear would rise up. What if I can't help them get over that? And so oftentimes I would overreact. Maybe you don't do this. I hope you don't. But there's a, an overreaction. And you're kind of like, well, it's no big deal. It's just a little thing. That is so wrong. Don't do that. When they come and express their sorrow, you can look at them. And the Bible says we weep with those that weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. But we can weep with them and go, oh, honey, I, I am so sorry that Sonia Renfrey dumped you with the dance. I, I am. I, I, listen, just saying I understand or you're not trying to push them into recovery that fast. You're, you're on their side. And then you can help them move past it. But if you just tell them to snap out of it, that doesn't work. And so just as, as a parenting tip, when someone, any, and by the way, this applies to any loved one. I've done it with Joy, and she has not been happy about it. She's come in and she's expressed some, so, sometimes she will look at me, she'll go, look, she'll go, right now, I just need you to be a husband. And then she'll tell me something, and she doesn't want to hear anything out of me other than, darling, I'm sorry that happened. But you'll be amazed at how that helps. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those that weep. God doesn't want them 
swallowed up with sorrow. You can help them come out of it. Because when you're swallowed up with sorrow, it becomes the biggest thing in our life. Look what this verse said. In fact, you say, I'm not making this up. On the contrary, you are ready to forgive and comfort. He's talking about an individual in the church. Lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. That's not where we want people to go. The Jews, the Jewish people have a tradition, it's interesting, called Shiva. Shiva means seven or sit with seven. And Jewish Shiva is when someone would lose a loved one. And if anyone knows and understands loss and grief, it's the Jews. And when, when someone would lose a loved one, then all the, the family members, the, the immediate family and even extended family would come and sit with them for seven days just to be with them, just to let them know you're not alone in your sorrow. But then on the seventh day, something very interesting would take place. The community would come and they would take that person, the person would walk out their door and they would walk with them around the block together. And they're signifying something. Signifying that we know you're hurting, we hurt with you, but healing can come. See, when we are able to, to come alongside someone who's hurting, man, that's such a help. But we're not just coming alongside so you can stay in that sorrow. We want to come and see if we can walk with you outside of that so you can get stronger. So we want to get people to a stronger place. And you want to get, when you're dealing with sorrow, it's going to come. You're going to feel it. But we want to get to the place where you are strong enough, where, where the encouragement you sense is stronger than the sorrow you sense. You know, people oftentimes will, you, you see them to kind of drown their sorrows with distractions. And it can go everything from something as innocuous as simply a television show to something as dramatic as, as drugs or alcohol, and they just drown themselves in it. But Joy, was talk, Joy and I were talking when she was a kid. She spent a lot of time alone. She really kind of was a, a, a sorrowful little kid. You wouldn't think about to see her now. But she was kind of sorrowful. And she said that she used to watch a television show. This was probably late 60s, early 70s. The Donnie and Marie Osmond show. Don't even, don't even try to YouTube it, guys. It's, it's, but, but Joy loved Donnie Osmond. Wanted to marry him. Didn't happen. But she said she would watch that show. She said, and when the show was over, she would cry. Because she had to face reality. If, if you're there and you're thinking, I'm, I can escape, I can escape, that's a temporary fix. It's not a long-term fix. So when you're dealing with, with sorrow, you want to get to a stronger place. It is a great idea to get outside help. Don't try to do this alone. Get some outside help. Say, so, well, what's outside help? You're sitting in outside help right now. Church is outside help. Church is a place where, listen, if you're going to a church where you walk out of there more depressed than you walked in, you need another church. <laughs> because the gospel is good news. It's where God can lift you and God can help you and God doesn't want you in that, in that situation. So, listen, when you're dealing with sorrow, don't isolate yourself. Don't go away from church. That's exactly where you want to be. And if you walk in going, all these people are going to know I have problems. All the people that you know have problems, I already have problems themselves. And they're not thinking about your problems, they're thinking about their problems. So don't let that bother you. Just come on. And we'll just come in and take our problems to the one who can do something about it and the one who can help us. And then here's another idea. God, you need godly friends and godly counselors who can give you godly counsel during this time. You don't need your buddy that goes, oh, dude, when I did that, I just got drunk for a week. That's not godly counsel. When you're going through a hard time, be like, oh man, forget women. I've been married seven times, forget them. None of them are good. That's not godly counsel. <laughs> you need someone that's going to look at you and go, listen, I know you're hurting and I know you're sorrowful, but I know this. I know God can help you and I know you can make it through this situation and I'm going to pray with you and I'm going to pray for you. We need people like that in our lives. 
You say, well, Alan, I don't have anybody like that in my life. You're sitting in a place that has people like that. And on Tuesday nights, we have counselors. And if you need help, you can come in here. We're not going to charge you anything. We're going to give you godly counsel. We're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about scriptures. We're going to talk about how God can do something bigger than your problem. We need outside help. But here's where we want to go. We want to get to the place where we can actually just do it ourselves. Where we can just... Say, so listen, you're going through a hard time, and I'm not saying you're isolated. I'm not saying being a Lone Ranger. But I'm saying sometimes I've come home, and I've had a day. <laughs> you ever have one of those days? You're like, oh, my gosh, what a day. And some days I would just sit there, and this is where my relationship with the Lord and where your relationship with the Lord really matters. This is our advantage as a believer. We've got someone we can go to, and we can thank him, and we can praise him. I love to read the Psalms. I love to, just to read the Scriptures. In fact, in, in Romans 15, 4, it says this. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Say, so how, how do I get out of this sorrow? I'm to feed some hope in. Feed some comfort in. And that's my last point is this. Seeing God and relating to God as a comforter. You see, God is not the source of your sorrow. He's the source of your help. And if you begin to come to him and say, Father, this hurts. This hurt me. I don't know really what I'm going to do at this, at this point. But I know you never left me and you never will. And I know I have you. And if I have you, you're going to help me. Not only can he help you, he can actually help you turn that whole situation around. Sorrow is real. We deal with it. But it doesn't have to be the permanent place. It's the place we visit, not the place we live. A, year, a few years ago, James, Dr. James Dobson tells the story of an elderly lady by the name of, um, her name was uh, Sarah Thornhope. And Stella, I'm sorry, her actual name was Stella. You can tell that's, a few years, that's kind of an old name. And Stella was facing Christmas, her first Christmas alone. And her husband had died a few months prior to that, had cancer and he died. And it just, the gloominess of it, the loneliness of it, the sorrow of it was really getting to her. And she decided one day, she said, I'm not even decor. I'm not even going to put up any Christmas decorations. Later that very same afternoon, late, late in the afternoon, she had a knock on the door. And when she opened the door, it was a delivery service. And the young man looked at her and said, uh, Stella Thornhill? She said, yeah. He said, I've, I've, would you sign for this, please? She said, come on in. It's cold. So young man came in with a big, big package. And... Uh, as she was signing, she said, what is it? He laughed and he opened the flap up. There's a six-week-old uh, golden uh, uh, yellow lab in there. He pulls this squiggling little lab. He said, he's six weeks old. He's already housebroken, which is a miracle. But anyway, um, <laughs> held, the little, held the little dog. And, and she said, who, who gave me this? And he handed her an envelope. She said, it's all there in the envelope. He said the dog was purchased in July while the, the, the mother was still pregnant and it was intended to be a, a Christmas present for you. Then handed her a book called How to Take Care of Your Labrador Retriever. She, she said in desperation, who gave me this? And he turned around and he smiled. And he said, your husband, ma'am, Merry Christmas. And when she opened up the envelope, in there was a letter that her husband had written her three weeks before he died. And the letter was full of love and full of encouragement and full of an admonishment for her to be strong. And he told her, he said, I am waiting for the day when we can be reunited again. But until then, I got you this little dog as a companion. And Stella looked down, wiped the tears from her eye, put the letter away, wiped her tears, and she picked the little guy up and kind of held him to her neck. She said, well, it's just me and you, buddy. And she said... And, and this, by the way, is a true story. She said as she looked out her window, she saw her neighbor's lights on her house. And she heard from the kitchen a Christmas carol, Joy to the Lord, the Lord, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. And she said, all of a sudden, she said, this most amazing peace just washed over her. And a joy, she said she couldn't describe it, but it just wiped out the grief and the loneliness. She looked at the little dog. She said, come on. He said, little fella, 
downstairs, I got a box with a Christmas tree and some decorations and a manger scene. She said, I think you're going to like it. James Dobson said this, and I agree with him. He says, God's got a way to signal us. Uh, it's light in the darkness, and it's a reminder that life is greater than death. That God is greater than Satan. That his power is greater than any power of the enemy. And that good overcomes evil. And that God's comfort can be greater than your sorrow. Would you bow your head with me for a moment? If you're here today, the, where this really starts, and where the comfort and the peace starts is like how Joy talked about during her little segment this morning. When she talked about the peace that came from her relationship with the Lord once she made Jesus her personal Lord and Savior. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. I'm going to ask you a question. We'll give you an opportunity today. If you've never made him the Lord and Savior of your life, or if you recognize in your heart, I've really walked away from God, but I want to come back. We're going to say a prayer. We're not going to have you stand up. We're not going to have you come down to the front. But right where you are, sitting right where you are, or watching online, you can make a decision that is the beginning of God's comfort and God's peace in your life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around. But if that's you that I'm talking to, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. And you say, you know, Alan, I don't know about my relationship with the Lord, but I want to, or I want to come back to him. Would you pray for me? We're going to do that. I need you to do one thing. Just slip your hand up across the auditorium and say, Alan, that's me. Would you pray for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, way in the back. Got you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Got you. Anybody else? Thank you for your courage. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. We are going to pray this prayer. Maybe you didn't pray this or didn't let, lift your hand, but you really wanted to. Or maybe you're watching online and you go, I, I want in on this. Listen, you're going to you pray this prayer. This is where it starts right here. We're going to pray it with you as a church family. You're not alone in this. Say, dear God, I know mankind needs a savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Now, the heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. Let me pray for you. Some of you have dealt with recent loss, loss of loved ones, loss of jobs, loss of relationships. Maybe just some other kind of loss. I didn't get them all, but you've experienced loss in your life. And I really believe that God's plan for you is that you not be swallowed up with it, that you can come out of it. Heavenly Father, I pray for those in here who are listening to me online, those who are sitting in here this morning. Father, those who've experienced a loss in their life that has seemingly swallowed them. But I thank you, Father, that you have the ability to reach down and lift us out of whatever pit we've gotten into. And I thank you for your strength. And I thank you for courage. And I thank you for hope rising up and comfort rising up. Because, Father, you've never wanted your children to be swallowed up with too much sorrow. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that today marks the beginning of coming out of that sorrow being the dominant thing in our lives. And we'll give you all the credit, all the praise, all the glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, if you have prayed that first prayer with us and you said, you know what, I wanted to receive Christ is my Savior. I want to come back to him. Right beside your feet is a card that says yes. If you'll fill it out, we'll get some information to you. Or if you'll text the word in to 313131, we'll again send you some information that will help you. And, uh, but regardless, we're going to pray for you even so. Hey, let me bless you before we go. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord is smiling on you and is gracious to you. The Lord is showing you his favor and giving you his peace. We love you. We're praying for you. Have a wonderful week. God bless.